Good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to um, Open Book 2023. Can I just say that there was a time in COVID when this theater, which is a historical and cultural value for us in the city, um, was closed down. And can we just have like a round of appreciation that for the fact that it's here? <laughs> So today's panel is a particularly exciting one, some beautiful pieces of work, and it's my great honor to introduce our three writers to you today. I'm going to start with Dawn, because I know Dawn, <laughs> so it's a, an easy start. Dawn Garish um, is, if for all those of you who don't know, a medical doctor. She's the founding member of what's called the Life Writing Collective, a very powerful initiative for connecting people to their stories. And she's got a very special process for doing this. For, so for all the aspirant writers out there, Dawn is a good place to start. Um, Dawn has written seven novels, two poetry collections, a nonfiction work, and a memoir. She's also done five plays and produced a short film and um, a very industrious career. And what remains is her very beautiful iridescent book that has just come out. I'm going to put this here because I am likely to drop things loudly during the course of this conversation. Next to Dawn, I, you know, I don't necessarily think you need an introduction, SJ no dear. And can I just say, SJ, am I allowed to say it stands for Stephanus Jakobus, but um, you go by the name fine. <laughs> no, you're not allowed. Okay, no, of course. <laughs> Big blunder. Um, and his book is um, Van Fathers in Fluchtelinge, the English version of uh, Fathers and Fugitives, and a, a very, very special piece of work. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this. And then uh, on my immediate left is Pussy Sekile Kamalo and her book Sunshine and Shadows. Um, and we are going to discover what uh, Sunshine and Shadows is all about during the course of this conversation. So just to start, um, just to give you a little teaser, a little appetizer, I'm going to ask, um, starting with you, Dawn, to just read a little extract from your book. Thanks, Joy. Um, so it's a book of short stories. It's quite hard to decide what to read, but um, actually this is what I read at the book launch because uh, it gives you a little taste of style. Well, there are many different kinds of style in the book. Uh, this, this story was written from a prompt given out by the, um, by the big issue, uh, which was the woman in the middle of the road, which I got completely wrong. Clearly, it's about women who sell the big issue, but like, I completely misinterpreted it. And uh, so this is what came to mind body, just the start of the story. It's called The Road to Shanghai. When I met you, I was grateful for the map of the future you offered me. It was your map, but I recognized even then that every journey requires sacrifices. I committed myself to this highway willingly. I lay down in the middle of the, that vision, confident that nothing bearing down from the future could destroy us. I never told you, but I really did it before our daughter split and spliced my life. Driving through the Karoo to Prince Albert to join you one radiant summer night, just after turning off the N1, I pulled up on the verge. I turned the headlights off, got out of the car, and lay down along the white line on the tar, still warm out of the oven of the sun. The stars sounded like a million softly whirring crickets. I tried not to think of you up ahead, waiting for me in our thatched cottage across the road from the Prince Albert Dairy. Then again, perhaps you weren't. You might have been at the pub passing the time with William Eurster or some other local. From up the road, I could hear you clearly. What the fuck are you doing? I had to concentrate not to let your voice in, not to feel your fear and obey your reasonable, incensed tone, ordering me back into the car. I imagined I was lying on the warm belly of the earth. I had just been born, and it opened my eyes for the first time. I had no sense of perspective, unsure whether the stars were close to my face or far away, whether the hums and ticks were coming from inside my head or from out behind the Milky Way. My breath was breathing me. I felt my heart galloping through my life. It felt good. This was a place I could relax into before the next drama. So she's on her way, terrified to tell her partner that she's pregnant. 
So Dawn, maybe now would be an appropriate point to just tell everybody a little bit about the collection of stories. Um, you know, just describe it to us. Uh, it's a very special collection, and, and I think that what I really appreciated about it is that um, while these stories stand on their own, some of them interconnect, and you. I'm glad you got that. <laughs> yes. In fact, you know, it becomes a bit of a puzzle. You have to loop back and go back and read bits to find out um, more about people you have read before, so that you just place their stories uh, as a whole. So, it's it's, it's a it's a deeply fulfilling book in that way, in showing aspects of people that we've seen on the periphery come to the fore in in, in subsequent chapters. So the stories in this book were written over about a 20-year period, um, just because something came to me or I got a prompt or a request or whatever. So some of them have been published before, about five or six. But, um, you know, you get these little cues. And some of them, actually, I thought were going to be novels, and they turned mm -hmm. into short stories. Um, so it was really lovely to have the opportunity, thank you, Karina, uh, to put them all together in one place. And then you start seeing, you know, because then you read through and you... You know, you edit it and you proofread it and you check it out and, you know, which ones are going in, which ones are going out. And then you start seeing certain connections about yourself, let alone the, the characters mm -hmm. in the book. But, you know, strange, often poetic connections, uh, maybe that speak to your own life. Like that one that I've just read to you, The Road to Shanghai, she, at some point she says, all these roads are connected, the whole world. You can, all the, like the world is, uh, sits in a net of these roads. And there's another story which talks about <coughs> how all the sewerage works connect the whole city as an <laughs> under, under toe, under belly, you know, the unconscious. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, and, and then some characters I, I hadn't finished with, so they ended up in other stories. And, I mean, I do have to say that you left lingering, wanting to, you become invested in the characters and wanting to know more about them and um, without because they actually could be spoilers. Without giving too much away, you'll find uh, a line about a previous character and go, oh my God, this happened to this person. Um, so there is an element or, almost of suspense, almost thriller sometimes, not that it's meant to necessarily be that, but I certainly was on edge discovering little bits about people who had come before in the book. So finally, not Stefanos Jakubas, <laughs> I forgot to actually mention, not that I think it needs mentioning, that that. Um, you have two collections of short stories, uh, a novel, The Third Reel, and um, you've won some awards for your writing, but also interestingly worked as a, as a, a lawyer um, in both New York and London, and your um, book is also about a, a writer who lives in, in London. So maybe start with um, just reading a little excerpt and then telling us about the book. Good. <coughs> Hopefully this isn't too long. Uh, on a Monday, shortly after lunch, bread and fruit, which his father hardly touched, they take another walk in the heat hanging motionless over the city bowl. They stop for coffee as usual. When they are seated facing each other, his father grows apologetic as if feeling compelled to initiate a modicum of interaction. I'm sorry I'm such bad company, he says. I really don't want to be a burden to my children in my old age. It's nothing, Daniel hears himself say, and it's no burden. All that's important is that we're here together. In fact, he wants to get up and walk away, abandon his father here. Not go back to the flat, but take a shortcut up Signal Hill, past Lion's Head, up Table Mountain, as far as he can go, without looking back once at the lone figure seated down there at the table for two. Without planning to do so, he starts telling his father about one of his exes in London. Even though his father still recognizes his children, there's hardly a trace of memory left. Admittedly, what his father would previously have known about Daniel doesn't amount to much. There was very little information there to shrivel away with the cerebral tissue. For at least a dozen years, they've never discussed a single aspect of each other's personal lives. His father would have known that Daniel was commuting at irregular intervals between London and Cape Town, that he sometimes penned bits of political and cultural journalism for British and South African newspapers, that he wrote fiction in, in the intervals. A peculiar pastime in the eyes of someone like his father, the investment banker, who had spent his prior working life in the world of financial power brokering. 
Years ago, when his father's approval still counted for something, Daniel worked as a management consultant in London. Of the shape of the life he's leading these days, his father would not have an inkling, especially not his personal life. What Daniel recounts now, he does, because he knows his father will have forgotten it within an hour or two, or maybe a minute or two, and perhaps also to break the silence. It's a fragment of the story of an old relationship. I must tell you about Eamon, Dad, one of my ex-lovers up there in the north, an Irishman. Four years ago, he moved in with, moved in with me in London, and about 11 months later, moved back to Dublin. His father just smiles. Daniel delves into the details of a trip he took with Eamon, why he selected this particular fragment he can't say. He talks about the week in Eastern Ireland where Eamon grew up. As he described the Irish landscape in detail, he observes his father's frozen smile and blurred eyes. Then he describes his and Eamon's mornings in a pokey guest house, adorned with Irish kitsch for the streams of American tourists traveling there to find their roots. He looks so straight at his father while expanding on the almost unbearable delight he and Eamon took in each other's bodies in the mornings. <coughs> there amidst shamrocks and grinning green leprechauns while the sun rose over the Irish sea. Daniel stops talking, tries to read his father's eyes. He wants to retrieve a scene from his childhood, one of him and his father together, just the two of them. Father and son kicking a ball, son on father's shoulders in a swimming pool, Laughter and play wrestling on the lawn at dusk, but the gaze is empty. All Daniel's mind's eye can come up with, whether he's conjuring or remembering it, is unclear, is a snapshot of his father and him somewhere on a wintry beach, perhaps in Cape Town, perhaps on a European trip, both of them silent in the wind, Daniel intently watching his dad, the father putting his hands in his pockets, the son instantly copying him. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, a bit in that piece uh, where he goes back to take care of his father as he's dying, where um, you just, in general, feel the sense of, of almost hopelessness of our, our inherent need to be seen and heard and, and the metaphor of how impossible that is sort of manifest in Daniel telling his father stories and his father has dementia and can't remember those stories. And so the retelling and the, you know, that constant kind of pursuit of trying to put oneself in front of somebody and to be seen and heard. But Sisa Keeley, this is your um, ninth book, is that right? Yes, yes. Wow, yes. so she does a lot of writing. Um, <laughs> do you want to read to us? Uh, yeah. Um. So I chose this excerpt uh, because we're talking of vulnerable bodies, right? Mm. So, <clears throat> no, you can't insert that inside me. I try getting up, but Ruvimbo holds me down. I know that you are scared, but do you have the money to buy the abortion pills? You know they only sell it for hard currency now. They don't accept bonds. Or are you ready to have this baby? She's right, I don't have the money, but this feels wrong. The lady is getting impatient and she hisses that I have to make up my mind as she doesn't have all day. She leaves us alone, her once bright dress sweeping the dirty floor. I don't want to do this, not like this, but I think of the look on my mother's face when she finds out I'm pregnant. I would graduate with a huge protruding belly but no ring on my finger. Who would hire me then? I could ask Jacob for, his mon for money, but he has made it abundantly clear that he wants nothing to do with me or this child. I say a short prayer in my heart and ask Ruvimbo to call the lady back in. She roughly pats my legs. Her hands feel foreign and intrusive as they grasp at my inner thighs. I close my eyes and will myself not to cry as the metal makes its way inside me. Bring the candle closer. My eyes aren't what they used to be. She snaps at Ruvimbo, who fumbles with the candle and hot wax lands on my inner thigh, causing me to yelp in pain. 
The searing pain is nothing compared to the pain that almost blinds me when the lady tugs at my placenta. I try to move and hold her hand, but Ruvimbo has my hands firmly in place and the lady slaps my thighs until I open them wider. She tugs again with much more force this time and it feels like someone is sewing my stomach in half. Cramps engulf me and I'm losing consciousness from all the pain. It is done. Use pads and remember, blood will be coming out. You can sit on that bucket for a while until it slows down. It feels like my whole lower back is on fire, but I had to do this. I had to. Mm, beautiful. So in, in some ways, all of these books um, deal with the subject that we're talking about today, vulnerable bodies, specifically in relation to grief. And I think that in each of the books, there's not just a story about the pathway to death and its aftermath, um, but also grief associated with the human experience and trying to make sense of it, um, trying to make sense of the quotidian and the daily, trying to make sense of a nascent future, um, trying to, to, to tap in to our existential crisis in some ways. What is the meaning of all of this? And um, finally, I think I'm going to start with you. So in a sense, your book is divided into five parts. And, and while they are weaved together to form a story as a whole, in some ways, they also stand as sort of uh, Parts on their own, um, they, they, they are in their entirety just as a separate piece. And there are different layers of grief in those five pieces, um, you know, starting with the first story, where, <laughs> which kept me up at night, by the way, I was <laughs> trying to figure out where is this going. So um, Daniel meeting the two Serbs, the, the bit where he goes back to nurse his father when he's dying, the, his father's uh, request in his will that he spends time with his cousin Tion and, and what unfolds there, um, the coming back to the country, the leaving the country, um, Talk to us about how you work with the notion of grief in, in your book. Yes, so, um, you know, quite a few deaths in this book. And, you know, I, um, in some way, where, whereas um, in the 19th century in, in Victorian novels, you know, sex seemed to be the taboo, you know, in the 21st century, death to some degree seems to be, to be the taboo, at least um, commercially, I, I remember a fellow novelist telling me that his British agent told him that you know, a child cannot die in his book because she would never ever <laughs> sell the book to anyone. <laughs> um, so and there's something Victorian in that, that respect as well, whereas of course um, you know, one of the givens of life is, well, the most fundamental given of life is, is one owns death and um, grief uh, for the deaths of others is another mm. one of the fundamental givens of, of, of our lives. So I don't quite know how one can write now, you know, a book without there being any deaths in it. Um, so, yes, Daniel, as you mentioned, Daniel, my main character, the, you know, not to give away too much about the story, but he loses to, it's an, an odd, interesting sort of friendship with the two Serbs that you mentioned in the first part of the book, but um, he loses those two friends. Um, he also, through the book, the course of the book, um, there is a there is a child a, a child that, that dies, um, and he um, loses a father um, with whom he had a difficult and problematic relationship. So um, the perspective is well, the narrative voice is such that one doesn't get an, an enormous amount of access to Daniel's inner life, um, even though it's. It's a close third person narrator. You know, Daniel is, you can see and hear what Daniel is seeing. It's like a camera being carried on his shoulder. Um, but I keep a certain amount of distance between the reader and his internal and his interior life. So to some degree, one has to uh, gather from what Daniel does and, and what hap you know, what, what, how he responds to it uh, in other ways as to how the grief um, uh, somehow impacts him and and his body, you know. 
Um, after his father's death, for instance, um, you don't get much access to what he's thinking, but he goes for the first time in years, he takes his kayak and he rows um, quite frantically across Table Bay, um, mm -hmm. hovering at points when there are cargo ships approaching um, and quite um, dangerously, um, you know, um, waiting until they almost reach him and then starting to row again. Uh, until he's at Blauberg and he, or Molnitten rather, and he um, sits there sweating on the beach. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm quite interested actually in, in physical responses to grief. Um, you know, knowing people who've been through various different uh, modes of responses to grief, um, it's quite interesting how people physically respond to it. Sometimes it's, um, you know, in this case, it's some, some, uh, some sort of physical excess, you know, some very mm. vigorous challenge of, of the body. Um, oddly, sometimes people also often experience an extremely high libido after a grief, which is quite mm. an interesting, well, sort of an, a heightenment of, you know, there's a heightened erotic response to grief. Mm. Um, it's almost as if, the, as if the body wants to remind one that, it's, that it is still alive, even though the person you're grieving isn't. Um, so I think there are always signs of what the grief does to, to, to my protagonist, um, but I think it's only in the very last section that one gets a, a true sense of w when the weight of the cumulative weight of the, of the grief that is experienced through the novel, um, the weight of it becomes very clear. Um, he's an old man, it's, it spans across the life, a large part of the life of Daniel, this book. He's from his sort of late 30s to his um, 70s. So. Um, I think the last part is probably most illustrative of what, what that cumulative weight of grief ultimately does to someone and to someone's body. Mm. And so, and what I liked about it is that the book is both temporal, yeah, at different points the grief is situated in time and place, but it's also, it transcends boundaries, it transcends time and, and is sort of a recurring theme. So Dawn, you know, in, in your collection, um, there are stories of comfort of, and grief, stories of presence and absence. I'm thinking particularly of Henry in his presence, Henry in his absence. Um, tell us how you work with the notion of grief in, in your book. So talking about Henry, there's a, that story <laughs> is called Remains, and um, it's a humorous story about what to do with someone's ashes. So, you know, this, this is a very domineering man whose uh, wife is both, I have to say, somewhat relieved when he dies, um, but also at a total loss because her life has been controlled by this man. And, you know, he's even um, controlling her from the little box of ashes, you know, what he wants and what he doesn't want and where, the ash where she must put the ashes and what to do with them. And so um, there was that. Uh, what also, uh, the, the subject matter also brought to mind, although there are quite a few deaths in the, in the novel, quite a lot of grief, but there's a story called Grip, which is about an elderly couple. He used to be a big mountaineer, doing all the big mountains, um, and they're now doing alien clearing near their home on the coast in the Eastern Cape, and they stay out too long, and it starts getting dark. And there are different responses to I incapacity, because they can't see, you know, they need cataract surgery. <laughs> they, they can't find the path, um, and he's determined not to be saved. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so it's another male <laughs> attribute. <laughs> where she just wants to like, sit down and, and stay the night, you know, but her grief is, before I die, she realizes, you know, she needs a hip replacement, she's starting to get sore, and the, the grief of, she, they're gonna die soon, and she needs to make amends to her daughter before she dies. And the, the last story is called um, 10 Essential Ingredients, which is a story of a, a woman who fell in love later in life um, with a man who was an activist and a also a very big character, um, but with real love between them, and he dies most inconveniently for her. Cause, and, and this question of what to do now. I, I read somewhere that grief is an education, it's a training, you know, that mm -hmm. what, you, what you've got to deal with is a, ch is a change of identity in every aspect of your life. So, you know, she's struggling with her changed identity and how to live her life now that she's alone. So yeah, those are the three that came to mind in terms of vulnerable body, bodies and, and grief, grieving. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. 
um, grief as a changing because it marks us indelibly and we are changed and we are forever changed. Um, as much as we learn how to live with it, we are changed. So, Busi Sekili, your book is very interesting because there's this juxtapositioning um, for those of you who, who haven't read the book between decadence, a lifestyle of champagne and abundance and sparkles and fine things in life, but juxtapositioned with the theme of love and loss, of betrayal, of hardship, sketched against the backdrop of a country, Zimbabwe, that has been pillaged, uh, fraught with corruption, as is our own country, actually. Um, so do you want to talk to, because, you know, in some ways the grief is visceral in your book, but it's also a book about finding joy yeah. in life. Um, I feel like I dealt with death in its different forms, right? Um, first, Zimbabwe in itself is dying, mm. you know, and that makes me sad because that, that's my country, but then there are parts of it that through its death has left us, its people wide open, you know? Um, and Vimba is very flippant in the way she wants to find someone to cushion this life for her. And when you first look at her, you think, okay, this is a girl who's very, um, what can you call this? Um, who's very materialistic. Mm -hmm. But then when you go deeper into the book, you realize that this is from the way she grew up, you know, from her suffering. So she doesn't want to suffer like that. She doesn't want her children to come into the suffering that she was raised in. And um, when you see the death of uh, the public health sector, mm -hmm. and also because it leaves people vulnerable, like Nosi, she has to go through this abortion that I just read. And it could easily be avoidable, right? If there was infrastructure in place, if it was allowed, if it was open, if it was accessible, she wouldn't have lost her womb. And then the death that she goes through, through that loss, you know, uh, the Nosi who was before that, and the Nosi who is after the death is different. And you know, at times we bury the grief deep inside and we don't really look at the mental repercussions of it, especially for uh, uh, black people. You know, mental health is something that um, we don't really focus on. Mm -hmm. So Uvimbae suffers from schizophrenia, mm -hmm. but she doesn't accept that. She, for her, it's just the voices that she used to hear when her mother died and people were calling her names from the bullying from, so she doesn't want to accept that. And when she's given the diagnosis that you have, she says she's not crazy because you know, for us mental health is now being called crazy, but at times it comes from grief, from, from you know, so there's that. And also allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough to accept that this is what you're going through and this is, and then coming out from that, coming stronger and, you know, so, yeah. I really appreciated that about the book, the, the foregrounding of mental health issues and the very mm -hmm. delicate way in which you, you approach it and uh, with great sensitivity and, you know, in, in a way that raises awareness and gets us thinking about how, uh, this, you know, the aspects of social stigmatization. And so, so yeah, that, that, that was a part of the book that I particularly enjoyed. So we're talking about grief, but in some ways we're also talking about vulnerable bodies in relation to grief. And I wanted to come back to something that finally started talking about. We, particularly in, the, in our societal context, we're conditioned into thinking about our bodies as sites of violence. We live in a highly violent society and a lot of our kind of, uh, uh, thought and the way in which we inhabit our bodies is in relation to violence. And so I just want to step away from that for a moment and to, to think about what we lose when we do that, the, um, what gets lost, which is sort of foregrounding our bodies as sites of pleasure, as sites of the erotic, as sites of awakening, as sites of juices flowing forth. Um, and Dawn, <laughs> I'm going to start with you there. There was um, a story, and um, is it called The Wedding Feast? Yeah? It's not autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a take home message, thank you. That was what I was going to ask, but I was reading this in bed, and I was like, 
Shu, <laughs> Shu, my dear, um, tell us, tell us about um, about pleasure in your book. Yeah. Um, well, it was a mistake. Um, <laughs> I, I got an invitation to write a, a, a short story of erotica. It went into a book of s southern South African women writing erotica, uh, ocean books. It doesn't exist anymore. Put it out. It didn't sell. I mean, hello, wouldn't you buy a book of... <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> and so it, it's extrapolated from something that happened to somebody else's somebody else. Just So I thought this is worth writing about. <laughs> but it's a, a huge extrapolation. Um, yeah, pleasure. Sure. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, you know, how to transform the rage of grief, because that's another aspect mm. of grief, into something beautiful, potentially. And the, the other story called Inheritance, which was a play initially, um, where an, an artist is standing next to her mother's coffin, and she's furious with her mother, not just for dying, but for their whole relationship. And now she can't, she can't confront her about the will. <laughs> And by the end of the story, she's figured out a way, but it's about that vulner vulnerability. You know, when you die, you, you, you can leave some terrible things behind in your will that nobody can go after you and say, why did you do that? But on the other hand, you can't stop them to doing what they want after you die. You know, it's yeah. like also that release yes. into finding your own mode or, or way into pleasure and meaning after somebody dies. Yeah. You know, since I changed the subject quite quickly. That's mm. true. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have to say, I mean, now that you're talking about that story, <laughs> it was also in a very different way. That's, that one just blew my mind. So I think that the thing that you need, the book should come with a warning. These are beautifully iridescent stories. But the imagination, oh, my word, like there's just so much power of how your mind works in the stories. Don't. So they truly are little books of art. There's like these, there's this book, there's the collection, and it's got these little gems, and you're so sad when they're done, but that's the beauty of them also, that they leave you hanging there. So now I want to come finally to, to your book and, and erotism, and I um, was trying to work up, because there this, this certainly is pleasure and erotica, but it's almost for Daniel, in some ways, perfunctory, that it's it's on the periphery, it's talked about, but so in the scenes, for example, with the Serbs, um, there's no detail. <laughs> we put it you should read some of my other books. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's detail. I'm definitely buying those. Not, not that the, this one is beautiful in its own right, um, but there's yeah. much left to the imagination. And, and then I think that. You know, it's special, but I also was wanting more towards the end of the relationship with Hein, mm. um, um, with, with uh, Tion, yeah. but through Hein's eyes, Hein is unsure, as are we as the reader, as to mm. what goes on behind the bedroom door. Yes. Yes, I guess, um, to take a step back, I think the, um, and it's always a matter of sort of reverse engineering, of course, when one tries to interpret your own work and figure <laughs> out what it, what it, you know, what it all means. And what, um, you know, one is always worse at it yourself than, than other people. Um, but if I look at my work, I think there's a lot of, um, there's uh, virtually all my characters seem to, um, you know, talk about fugitives. They all seem to be escaping from or fleeing something. And it, what they often seem to be escaping is some sort of framework of, of convention, if you will, um, you know, the kind of things that people in a late capitalist society do to, mm -hmm. to generate meaning, you know, and, which, mm -hmm. and a lot of it has to do with making money, apparently. You know, f Daniel's father is, a, is a, an investment banker, uh, you know, and, and uh, has built up a lot of capital um, and so on. So, um, and... But each of these characters, you know, my previous books in different ways, my, my previous novel of the third reel focused on a, a lot of, on a number of young people who are squatting in 1980s London, you know, in the Thatch Right mm. era, and they're making art, and they, you know, taking drugs and, and, and having lots of sex and make, you know, making bad art, in fact. Um, <laughs> so, um, and that is their way of, you know, swooning, if you will, trying to escape. Um, so I think the, and in this book a little less so perhaps, as you point out, but mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the, 
the pleasure of the body, you know, the erotic often is part of that escape. It's one of the roots of, mm. of um, a, and they usually failed routes of escape. Um, mm. You know, as I say, being a, you know, being a drug, drug taking, um, art making young person in patch fried London squatting didn't really lead to any sort of utopia. Um, but there's always some sort of attempt, um, clumsy as it might be, to, of escaping all of that. And, and Daniel, I think, in this book is, is a similar sort of character. And, um, and of course, well, death, of course, is the ultimate escape. It's the ultimate mm. way of fleeing. It's the ultimate swooning. You know, it's, it's the... Um, um, but... Um, so, I think in part, to at least his erotic history, if you will, in London is, is part of that escape route. Um, with his cousin Tion, it becomes something different. You know, I think there's probably a, a deepening of, of, of emotion and of, of um, knowledge of what is required to, to escape the, the dysfunction of his relationship with his father and, and um, the difficult past in a brutal, in a brutal country. Uh, so, uh, I certainly do have to go and read the other one to just <laughs> see that I'm interested in, in how they, they differ. Oh. So now, ooh, wow, how do we, <laughs> how, <laughs> okay, so, how, I, I, yep, so there are some penises <laughs> in the book. Um, there's some riding on penises, there's some, um, it's a lot of <laughs> writing on penises, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, but what I loved about it is that the 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 you know Vimbai and the women in the book have agency. They are stepping into the power of I am going to have a penis and this is what I'm doing and there's no explanation and I'm not sorry about it and they are sexy alive and they are beautifully decadent and they step in and they claim it and this is me and. It's like you're just kickstarting a sexual revolution amongst young women going, own it, step in your bodies, enjoy. Tell us about what you did there. <laughs> or did I read that all wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, you read it right. You, you definitely read it right. Uh, but I, I'm still stuck on, did, did he sleep with his cousin? <laughs> we were trying to figure that out. You'll we'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so now, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of, I feel like, um, in as much as uh, Vimbai uh, uses her body as a weapon as well, uh, but also, yes, as you say, she has a lot of agency. She chooses who to sleep with, who to, and she, she's averse to struggle, what she calls struggle love. You know, the romanticization of poverty to say if you're a girl, you're supposed to, if you love someone, then only then can you. She uses her body. She wants to enjoy her body. You know, she, 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 she sleeps with Chiroba just because he used to be a crush and because she, 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 she wants to get that off her list. Mm -hmm. And she knows it's not going to be deeper than that. But she has this. And what does she call it? An itch to scratch. And he it just happens to be the penis to scratch it for her. But also, <laughs> but yes, um, I did. Um, I think uh, we had a lot, <laughs> Steph and I had a lot of back and forth in terms of um, how I wanted it to be portrayed. I wanted a penis to be a penis, a vagina, a vagina. You know, I didn't want to, oh, her, her whole flower, her petals, her, and, no. And my personal <laughs> favorite, his member. <laughs> his joystick, his no, joystick. like, no. So, yes, it's sort of, um, there's also, there's a, a form of vulnerability in opening yourself up like that because then you leave it up to people to judge you. You know, mm. the way Tafadzwa ultimately judges Vimbai, right? Mm. Uh, because even though they carry on this romantic relationship, when it sours, he starts calling her names. Um, I thought she was sleeping with these guys because you're an orphan, because of this and that. And so she opens herself to that, to that criticism of when people know, but she does point out that he probably slept with more women than her, but then she gets judged, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and that's, 
basically what it is with women is that they, we have the illusion of having the choice, right? Mm. Uh, it's your body, you can choose. Like this is the anthem right now as modern women. But when you do make that choice, you get ostracized for it. Oh, yeah. she's a slut, she's this and that. She's, but why are we becoming vulnerable in our bodies, yet we are told that we have the choice? Yeah. And I think that you, you, you capture that so beautifully that as much as Vimbai has agency, she is a person living within a gendered social order and, and her relationships are navigated within the confines of those power dynamics, uh, uh, whether it's uh, is it, um, Ruby and her father, yes. Vimbai and, and in her relationships and, and you know, in, in essence, this, that kind of patriarchal framework is very much there kind of keeping everything in check. I have so many more questions, but I have been asked to be kind to all of you who have bought tickets to um, <laughs> not come and listen to me, but to them, and you might well have questions of your own. So I'm going to pause there and just see uh, if there are any questions or comments that anybody in the audience would like to make. I think we do have a roving mic. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, I'm still trying to frame the question a bit in my head, but uh, it's mostly for Stefania, if that's if I got your name right. Um, it's about uh, how do you grieve someone, a father that sort of it sounds like he quite wants to identify with, and in some ways still identifies with, although his feeling is very ambivalent and um, and for the most part quite distant. Uh, how, how, what do you think about sort of the grieving process of somebody uh, in that kind of situation and maybe for everyone sort of how, does, how do you think pleasure is impacted by that kind of relationship? Mm. I, um, I just want to, to add on to that, Fanny. You know, there's the, what I, what I appreciated about your book is that it brought something very personal to the fore for me in, um, I, I lost my dad at the beginning of lockdown and you know, a, a very close relationship with him and deeply mourned him. Mm. But he was also a very difficult person. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not blind to the immense difficulty I had with him as much as the, also a relationship of great love. And there was a scene in the book that particularly touched me where it was um, where they go for the walk. His dad wants to go for a walk yes. and the sun is pelting down and it's scorching hot. And he pushes him beyond his limits in almost a juvenile, cruel mm. way. Um, and there was a moment in which we can sort of all relate to both loving mm. and moments. They are temporary, but they are moments of almost despising possibly of what a person does or mm. who they can be or who they are in a moment. So maybe just to take sure. that question and add a bit on. Yes, I guess all of us have degrees of ambivalence in our parental, you know, parent-child relationships. Um, and I guess grieving a parent who dies when the relationship was particularly complex or particularly um, uh, ambivalent uh, makes the grief, certainly makes the grief far more complex. But as you mm -hmm. say, even even the process, if, if it isn't a sudden death, as in, in the case of, of, of my character, who then almost in a forced, forced manner because there's no one else. He, mm -hmm. His sister doesn't want to or isn't available to take care of his father in his last days. And then the father is also um, you know, in, this, in a state of dementia at that point. And necessarily, I think in particular in this, this novel is in, in large part about complex relationships between fathers and sons or, and about absent fathers. And I think necessarily that, that, that last part of the relationship, I mean, caring uh, you know, for, for someone who's ill or dying in itself is a highly complex, mm -hmm. um, kind of creates a highly complex sort of relationship with all kinds of ambivalences and, and um, res resentments potentially. Um, and guilt about the resentment yes. and the ambivalency, of course, as well. Um, and then if it's a parent who is, um, who has some, some form of dementia, um, 
and rationality has gone, that makes it harder, I think. Um, and in this case, particularly where the father has um, moments of clarity and then periods during which he is like a blank sheet, a blank s slate, he doesn't take in everything, mm -hmm. makes it even, f even more complicated. So, I mean, to answer your question directly, I think, you know, I, I guess what follows would be what, what psychologists, clinical psychologists might call um, complex grief or complicated grief. Um, it's kind of grief that seem that would take longer to resolve. You know, resolve is, of course, a, not quite the word with grief. It never quite ends. It doesn't, um, doesn't resolve in that manner. But um, yes, no doubt there's, there would be complex, enduring grief. It's a grief um, that follows on an, a relationship that never reached some sort of equilibrium or some sort of um, resolution. Mm. It's, it's particularly poignant in um, the, the metaphor of Hein sort of on this endless physical journey and, and kind of metaphorical journey in, in searching for, for something for the father. Any if other if questions? If I can just Mr. add Archer. that the, the one, the, the only real uh, pleasure in my parents dying is I could write what I like. <laughs> I, was, I was always pushing against that boundary. Oh, my parents can read this. You know, <laughs> <laughs> once, once they're gone, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else? Yes. Um, so we need the mic down here. Oh, um, so okay, up there, and then we'll come to you next. That's a good coincidence because I was about to ask that question of, uh, um, have you ever written anything that was like transparently autobiographical enough that people accused you or <laughs> in general made your life difficult because they thought you were writing about them in a story or a thing. So I think that must be one of the most difficult things as writers to just, you have to go up your own life. But at the same time, the people who are gonna read your book are well, the ones who are gonna engage with you about are the people in your life you base some of the stories on and that kind of thing. So have you ever had trouble in that way? Um, not really in one of my books, but um, Facebook, Facebook. Strange enough. So um, I used to have what I called Monday motivations, whereby I would address issues that women faced, right? Um, I will talk about relationships, dating, divorce, whatever. And so there was this, um, what can I, oh, I can't really say. But she was a family member, um, married, marital family member. So she wasn't really family, but yeah. So then she screenshotted <laughs> something that I wrote because it, it translated to basically her complicated relationship. And I almost got called in for a family meeting over that, but then, yeah, <laughs> and <laughs> it just happens. A lot of people assume that just because you're a writer, you, you write about them, but then, you know, basically as a writer, we look at people, not just only those close to us, but around us, it's society as a whole. And you know, at times we write about these things and it's like a preacher, right? Uh, at times when a preacher is preaching, you might feel like, mm, why are you getting so personal? But <laughs> they're just preaching, so. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if I might add something sure. to that, yes, I think the only thing that, that seemed to sometimes bother people more than being present or imagining that they recognize themselves in your work is, the, is, is, is if they're absent from it. <laughs> um, if they're absent from your imaginative world. Um, <laughs> Can't get it right, eh? <laughs> uh, and actually, this one is based on um, Vimbai is my friend from college, so she agreed for me to use her name, surname, middle name, and her husband's name, but in the book she doesn't end up with a husband. So that's fun when I meet him. <laughs> so, th so this is a confidential space. Um, safe, safe space. I, yeah. So um, my ex-husband doesn't have the same surname, and those of you who know him know the story anyway, but when I gave him breaking milk, I said, um, Leonard isn't you, and Kate isn't me, but there were certain conversations that we had, or arguments that we had during divorce that were too good to waste, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Joe, now you've given me ideas. I've got many books to write then, if, we, if we're talking ex-husbands. Um, we had a question down here. Hi, I've got 
got so many thoughts, and I want to say that all of those pieces were utterly extraordinary and really well done. Yeah. But um, let me see if I can put my thoughts together. The one thing is that grief is often so much associated with reproduction. You know, having babies, or not having babies, or babies dying, or, you know, in, in, in generations. So it's a hell of a lot to do about birth and death at whatever stage. But also, that um, just one thing was that, you know, it's one thing I noticed with newborn, I had this incredible this fantasy that um, this was a man um, going to commit suicide. That is what I, my fantasy is, but it, that story could have opened to so many different things. Um, so that's the one thing. The other thing was that grief and I, when my mom died, she died very suddenly and I had a difficult relationship with her and I was three months away from having a really, we were trying to, we, well, I sort of got to a better place with her, but she died incredibly suddenly. But what was very surprising about the you know, talking about grief and what all also comes with it was that I experienced there was a, she was living in a um, uh, retirement village and she'd been spent a year there and she'd sort of la landscaped the whole place and had made a lots and lots of friends. What happened was a sense of incredible tenderness when you grieve. So it's not just I felt I opened to, to a kind of tenderness I'd never really experienced before. Hmm. So it can bring yeah. huge opening to into the self into different experiences mm. so anyway those are just a couple of mm. thanks Lizzie. Uh, that i have but thank you that those were absolutely amazing okay don did you want to to, to s respond yeah which one did you think you were, was going to commit suicide <laughs> the very first one we I thought it was a man lying on the, uh, on the okay. road. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. yes. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay, I got it. <laughs> yes, I, okay. And, you know, so I was really surprised yeah, yeah. to hear it was a woman who was pregnant. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I must admit, I also thought it was going a particular way until it didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to, my eyesight is bad. Is there anybody else before we, we just round off? Okay, so j just to say also that in all of these books, we uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but pain is a, is a, a thread being woven um, very inextricably into into each of these stories, and I think that that's the bit that kind of most sat with me. Um, it's just the the very different ways, but the very careful ways in which you write about pain and the human experience and how we navigate our way through pain, how we, how we sometimes don't cope, how we sometimes f fall apart, how we pick up the pieces. And so I think that, you know, if, um, each of these books is worth, if, if, if you in any way in your life um, have questions about how to sit comfortably in the discomfort of pain. I think that these books are gems in getting you to think about that. Um, on that note, I want to end by saying that books in this country has become tremendously expensive. Mm -hmm. They are almost a luxury item, but they're not, because they're very, uh, they're very important to how we change our cognitive views of the world in which we live, how we think about the society in which we live, how we think about our existence. And so they really are little um, survivor tools. And to just end by thanking the writers right. here, thanking the publishers and thanking the sponsors who make um, a festival like the Open Book Festival possible, and asking each of you, um, and I know I'm talking to book lovers, you wouldn't be here if you're not, to think about, I'm sorry, this is my own kind of course, to think about social equity and taking books into places where they are needed, where people don't have the resources to, um, to buy them. And as you leave here, to please go and support these writers and their very beautiful books. I promise that you're in for a treat. Thank you very much. So, so <laughs>just to add that um, that joy has her own book on on the festival uh, oh, the other you. me so she will also be available to sign books i'm sure <laughs>
Thank you, Devon. Thank you so much. Thank you.